Texas, you were able to build the Gigafactory. I remember when you got the plot of land, and then yeah. I remember, it seemed like it was less than two years when you had the party to open it. Yeah. From, we, from yeah. start of construction to completion uh, was 14 months. 14. 14 months. Is there anywhere on the planet that would go faster? Is like China faster than that? Uh, China was 11 months. Got it. So Texas, China, 11 and 14 months. California, how and, many months? And just to give you a sense of size, the Tesla Gigafactory in China is three times the size of the Pentagon. Which was the biggest building in America. Uh, no, there are bigger buildings, but the Pentagon's a pretty big one. Yeah, or it was the biggest. In, in, the units, time, yeah. in units of Pentagon, it's like three. <laughs> okay, three Pentagons and counting. <laughs> yeah. Got it. In 14 months. Um, the, just, the, just the regulatory approvals in California would have taken two years. So that's, that's the issue. We're shifting gears to AI. Uh, Peter was here earlier and he was talking about how so far the only company to really make money off AI is NVIDIA with the chips. Do you have a sense yet of where you think the big applications will be from AI? Is it going to be an enabling self-driving? Is it going to be enabling robots? Is it transforming industries? I mean, still, I think, early in terms of where the big business impact is going to be. Do you have a sense? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the spending on AI probably runs ahead of, I mean, it does run ahead of the revenue right now. That's, there's no question about that. The rate of improvement of AI is faster than any technology I've ever seen by far. For example, a Turing test used to be a thing. Now, you, you know, your basic uh, open source random LLM you're writing on a friggin' Raspberry Pi probably could beat the Turing test. The good future of AI is one of immense prosperity, an age of abundance, no shortage of goods and services. Everyone can have whatever they want, unless, ex except for things we artificially de define to be scarce, like some special artwork. Anything that is a manufactured good or provided service, I think with the advent of AI plus robotics, that the cost of goods and services will be, will trend to zero. Like, or, or, I'm not saying it'd be actually zero, but it'll be, every, everyone will be able to have anything they want. Uh, that, that's the good future. Uh, you know, in, in my view, that's probably 80% likely. So look on the bright side. Well, Only 20%, nice. 20 percent probably of annihilation. It's nothing. <laughs> um, is the 20% is the like, what does that look like? I mean, frankly, I do have to go engage in some degree of, of deliberate suspension of disbelief with respect to AI <laughs> in order to sleep well. Um, <laughs> And even then, because I, I, I think the actual issue, the, mo the most likely issue is like, well, how do we find meaning in a world where AI can do everything we can do, a bit better? That is perhaps the bigger challenge. Now, at this point, I know more and more people who are retired and they seem to enjoy that life. But I think that, that may be, may, maybe there'll be some crisis of meaning, like it, because the computer can do everything you can do, but better. So may, maybe that'll be a challenge. You need the sort of end effectors. You need the, the ro autonomous cars, and you need the sort of humanoid robots or ro you know, general purpose robots. Uh, but the, the, once you have general purpose humanoid robots, autonomous vehicles, you really, you, you, you can build anything. And, and, and this, this, I think that there's no actual limit to the size of the economy. I mean, there's obviously, you, you know, the mass of Earth, you know, like that would be a one limit. But the, the economy is, is really just the average productivity per person times number of people. That's the economy. And if you've, if you've got humanoid robots that can do, there's no real limit on the number of humanoid robots, and, and they, they can operate very intelligently, then, then there's no actual limit to the economy. In it. There's no meaningful limit to the economy. You guys just turned on Colossus, yeah. which is like the largest private compute cluster, I guess, of GPUs anywhere. Uh, think, yes, right? it's, it's, the, it's the most powerful supercomputer of any kind. Which sort of speaks to what David said and kind of what Peter said, which is a lot of the economic value so far of AI, AI has entirely gone to NVIDIA. But there are people with alternatives, and you're actually one with an alternative. Now, you have a very specific case because Dojo is really about images and large images, huge video. So um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the Tesla problem is different from the, you know, the sort of LLM problem. Uh, the, the nature of the intelligence actually is actually, what, what matters in the AI is, is different to, to the point you just made, which is that in, the, in Tesla's case, the context uh, length is very long. So we've got gigabytes of context. Gigabytes of context windows, yeah. Uh, I was just bringing it up. It's kind of billions of tokens of context. Right. Not, not any amount of context because you've got seven, seven cameras and if, if you've got several, you know, let's say you've got a, a minute of several high-def high cameras, then that's gigabytes. So you, you need to compress. And so the Tesla problem is you've got to compress a gigantic context into the, the pixels that, are, that actually matter and condense that over a time. And so you've got to, in, in both the time dimension and the space dimension, you've got to compress the pixels in space and the pixels over in time and then have that inference done on a tiny computer, relatively speaking, a small, you know, a few hundred watts. It's a Tesla-designed AI inference computer. 
uh, which is by the way, still the best, there, there isn't a better thing we could buy from suppliers. So the Tesla designed guy inference computer that's in the cars is better than anything we, we could buy from any supplier. Just by the way, that's kind of a, well, by the, way, non, the, the, the Tesla AI, AI chip team is extremely good. Well, you guys, in the design, there was a technical paper and there was a deck that somebody on your team from Tesla published and it was stunning to me. You designed your own transport control, like layer over ethernet. You're like, ah, ethernet's not good enough for us. Yeah. So you had this TT, TOE or something and you're like, oh, we're just gonna reinvent ethernet and like string these chips. It's pretty incredible stuff that's happening. No, the team, the, the, the Tesla chip design team is extremely, extremely good. Is there a world where, for example, other people over time that need you know some sort of like video use case or image yeah, use yeah. case so, so theoretically you know you'd say oh yeah. why not you know i have some extra cycles over here so we should kind of make you a competitor of nvidia it's not intentionally per se but yeah i mean you know there's this training and inference and we, we, we do have the you know two, those two projects at tesla we've got dojo which is the the training computer uh and then um you know our inference chip, which is in every every car, in first computer. And, and uh, Dojo, we've only had Dojo 1. Dojo 2 is, um, you know, should be, we should have Dojo 2 in volume towards the end of next year. And, and that, that that will be, we, we think, sort of co comparable to you know, sort of a B200 type, type system, a training system. You know, so there's, I guess there's some potential for, for that to be used as a service. But do Dojo is, is, is just kind of like, I mean, we're, we're, we're I guess I, I guess I have like some improved confidence in Dojo, but I think we, we won't really know how good Dojo is until probably version three. Like it usually takes three major iterations on a technology for it to be to be excellent, um, and we'll only have the second major iteration next year. The third iteration, I don't know, maybe late 26 or something like that. How's the, uh, how's the Optimus um, project going? I remember when we talked last, um, and you said this publicly that. It's in doing some light testing inside the factory. It's actually being useful. What's the build of materials and when, you know, for something like that at scale, so when you start making it like you're making the Model 3 now and there's a million of them coming off the factory line, what would, the, would they cost, 20, 30, 40,000 dollars, you think? Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, I've discovered that really that anything made in sufficient volume will asymptotically approach the cost of its materials. So some things are constrained by the cost of intellectual property and like for patents and stuff. So a lot of, you know, what, what's in a, a chip is like paying, paying royalties and depreciation of the chip fab. So, but the, the actual marginal cost of the chips is very low. So, so, so Optimus, it obviously is a humanoid robot. It, it is, it weighs much less and is much smaller than a car. You could expect that in high volume, and I'd say that you also probably need three, three production versions of Optimus. So you need to, refine the design three major times and, and then you need to scale production to sort of the million unit plus per year level. I think at that point the cost, the labor and materials on Optimus is probably not much more than $10,000. That's a decade long journey maybe? It, it, basically think of it like the, the Optimus will cost less than a small car. Right. At, at scale volume with three major iterations of technology and, and so if a small car it costs $25,000 it's, it's probably like a, a $20,000 for, for an Optimus for a humanoid robot that can be your your body like a combination of r2d2 and c3po but better yeah um, i mean you know that's that's the, and I, honestly i think people are gonna get really attached to their humanoid robot because i mean like you look at sort of you watch star wars and it's like r2d2 and c3 i love those guys you know they're awesome and their their personality and and i mean and all r all, all r2 could do is just beef at you right <laughs> I, I, I yeah. can't speak english um <laughs> and you see 3PO to translate the beeps, you know. So you're so. in year two of that, if you did two or three years per iteration or something, it's a decade-long journey for this to hit some sort of scale. Um, and I, I would say mid major iterations are less than two years, so it's probably on the order of five, five years, maybe six to get to a million units a year. And at that price point, everybody can afford one, yes. planet Earth. I mean, it's going to be that one-to-one, two-to-one. What do you think, ultimately, if we're sitting here in 30 years, the number of robots on the planet versus humans? Yeah, I think the number of robots will vastly exceed the number of humans. Vastly, yeah. Vastly okay. exceed. I mean, you have to say, like, who would not want a robot buddy? Everyone wants a robot buddy. Totally. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, it, it, especially if it can take care of your, your, take your dog for a walk, it could, you know, mow the lawn, it could watch your kids, uh, it could, you know, <laughs> like, it could, it could teach your kids, it could, it could... Well, we could uh, also send it to Mars. Yeah, absolutely. So we could send a lot of robots to Mars to do the work needed to yeah. make it a colonized planet for you. And Mars is already the robot planet. There's like a whole bunch of, yeah. you know, robots, like rovers and... It's only robots. Helicopter, yes, yeah, only robots. No, I, th I think the, the sort of useful humanoid robot opportunity is the single biggest opportunity ever.
because if you assume like, I mean, the, the, I think the ratio of humanoid robots to humans is going to be at least two to one, maybe three to one. Everybody, everybody, everybody will want one, and then there will be a bunch of robots that you don't see that are making goods and services. And you think it's a general one generalized robot that then learns how to do different tasks, or yeah, hey, um, I mean, we, we are a generalized. Uh, yeah, we're a general. We're, we're just non-robot. We're just made of meat. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're a meat pup. A generalized we're, we're, meat pup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm operating my meat puppet, you know. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, we are actually, and, and, and by the way, it, it turns out like, as we're designing Optimus, we sort of learn more and more about why humans are shaped the way they're shaped. And, you know, and why we have five fingers and why your little finger is smaller than, you know, your index finger. You know, obviously why you have opposable thumbs, but also why, for example, your, the muscles, the, the major muscles that operate your hand are actually in your forearm and, and your, Fingers are primarily operated in like, <laughs> um, your, 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 the, the muscles that actuate your fingers are located, the vast majority of, the, of, the, of your finger strength is actually coming from your forearm, and your fingers are being operated by tendons, little strings. And so the current version of the Optimus hand uh, has the actuators in the hand and has only 11 degrees of freedom. So it can't, it's not as, it doesn't have all the mm. degrees of freedom of human hand, which has, depending on how you count it, are roughly 25 degrees of freedom. Not strong enough in certain ways because the actuators have to fit in the hand. So the next generation Optimus hand, uh, which we have in prototype form, uh, the, the actuators have moved to the forearm, just like a human, and they operate the, the fingers th through cables. And, and, it, and the, ne the next generation hand has 22 degrees of freedom, which we think is a, a, enough to do almost anything that a human can do. And presumably, I, th I think it was written that X and Tesla may work together and you know, provide services, but my immediate thought went to, oh, if you just provide a grok to the robot, then the robot has a personality and can process oh, yeah. voice and video and images and all of that stuff. Yeah, as we, uh, it's, it's as we wrap here,